tomorrow, Sunday, June 19th, is the commemoration of Juneteenth, also known as Emancipation Day or Day of Freedom. So what's the real history behind Juneteenth? For insight into this, let's turn to our first guest. He holds the Moore's Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book is entitled The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of American Fascism. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, sir, welcome back to Inside the Issues. Thank you for inviting me. So before we get into the details of your book, uh, Juneteenth, uh, the standard narrative is, uh, as we know, on the January 1st, 1863, President Lincoln declares the end of slavery with the Emancipation Procl Proclamation, when actually it applied only to the states that had seceded from the U.S., leaving the enslavement of Africans in America untouched by the, the border state, the loyal border states. It also expressly exempted parts of the confederacy the southern secessionist states that had already come under northern control but most important the, it it the freedom it promised depended on a union uh, military victory but be that as it may as the story goes two and a half years after that uh, and two months after the end of the civil war union troops arrived in galveston texas on june 19th 1865 to find that news of the proclamation had not yet reached Galveston and the people were still being held as slaves. Speak to that narrative, especially did, did I state anything wrong? And this whole thing about news of proclamation not reaching Galveston. Well, there are so many holes in the traditional story of Juneteenth, I hardly know where to begin. But let me first of all say that I support, needless to say, this new holiday but I also support historical accuracy. For example, January 1st, 1863, as you correctly suggest, the Emancipation Proclamation had a limited reach. I mean, it certainly didn't reach Texas, which <laughs> was in rebellion against the Lincoln government. It would be as if the US Congress passed a law tomorrow legalizing whatever slavery still exists in Mauritania and West Africa. It might be a nice and noble gesture, but the U.S. government's remit does not reach, at least in a formal sense, uh, to Mauritania. Second of all, this idea that Black people didn't know that they were free, well, first of all, as I said, uh, there was a question as to whether or not the Emancipation Proclamation actually applied in Texas. But second of all, it, it, it really belies the point that there was this grapevine that is well known and well documented amongst the enslaved, where certainly they had received news of the Emancipation Proclamation, but what were they going to do about it when they were having to work for free under gunpoint? And it's, it's not only that, but even after June 19th, 1865, uh, there were cases of people working for free in a de facto form of slavery under gunpoint. In fact, as I argue in the book, which is now on the table as we speak, that June 19th, 1867 is a date that brings us closer to emancipation than June 19th, 1865. What I mean by that is, as many of us should know, Cinco de Mayo, May 5th, it marks a victory of Mexican forces in Mexico over a French occupation force that had taken the opportunity to take over this Southern neighbor as the United States was bogged down in the Civil War. What happens is that the Texas enslavers had this diabolical idea that either A, they could continue slavery even after Appomattox, that is to say the formal surrender of the so-called Confederate States of America, and General Robert E. Lee in April 1865, because Texas was the Confederate state least damaged by the U.S. Civil War, which then helps to shed light on why after App Appomattox, you see enslavers from points east, Mississippi, Georgia, mm -hmm. Virginia, et cetera, 
of fleeing into Texas with their so-called property enslaved Africans in tow, which helps to shed light on why it is that today in 2022, Texas has the largest black population in the United States of America. So the idea was either A, that Texas enslavers would wage this rear guard action against the post-Lincoln regime in Washington, D.C., led by President Andrew Johnson, or B, the Texas enslavers would move in mass into French-occupied Mexico and continue slavery there. And recall, as I'm sure we'll note sooner rather than later, uh, Texas had seceded from Mexico in the first instance in 1836, the counter-revolution of 1836, to quote the title of my book, precisely because Mexico had moved to abolish slavery under a president of African descent, speaking of Vicente, Vicente Guerrero, a few years before 1836. And rather than accede to that decree, you had these freebooters and cutthroats led by enslavers like Sam Houston and Stephen F. Austin, who then rather ostentatiously and arrogantly bequeathed their names to cities that become major urban nodes in the now United States of America, rather than accede to that decree, they secede uh, and lead a secession uh, from Mexico. And then by uh, 1861, the Texas enslaver uh, uh, secede again. The problem for the second plan to continue slavery in Mexico was that it did not go down very well in Mexico <laughs> itself. Uh, there was a mass uprising, which leads to the execution of the Mexican, of the French puppet leader in Mexico, speaking of Maximilian, that date being June 19th, 1867. And it's precisely that date that brings the enslaved population of Texas closer to freedom. And that's one of the reasons why I do not begrudge the Juneteenth holiday, because there is a certain validity to it. But the validity rests on June 19th, 1867, uh, much more so than June 19th, 1865. I want to go back to a point that you just made about uh, enslavers moving south, I'm sorry, west, uh, southwest, uh, from, say, Mississippi and Virginia into Texas. And you write, the Africans in Texas had a wider range of jobs, not only in cotton, but rice, sugar, timber cattle, cattle ranching and shipping. As slavery was decomposing in 1864 to 1865, many enslavers due east began flooding into Texas. Official figures suggest there were 58,161 Africans in Texas in 1851, but 182,566 a decade later and even more by 1870. And that's a piece of the history that very few of us uh, have, have ever been taught. And there are many reasons for that exponential growth in population. The so-called Republic of Texas, this is independent Texas. Texas was an independent country between 1836 and 1845, but could not withstand abolitionist pressure, not only from the United States, but from London and particularly revolutionary Haiti. And so Texas was forced to join the United States of America in 1845. However, during that brief period, 1836 to 1845, Texas exceeded all expectations by becoming a global leader of the inglorious African slave trade. The Lone Star flag of Texas could be found off the coast of Cuba, one of the reasons why Cuba's black population exploded precisely between 1836 and 1845 was because of the maniacal energy of Texas enslavers. The Lone Star flag could be found off the coast of Brazil. One of the reasons why the black population of Brazil, and as you know, black, blacks in Brazil are the largest black population mm -hmm. uh, west of Nigeria certainly larger than that of the United States of America, was precisely because of the maniacal energy of Texas and slavers, and of course, off the coast of Angola as well, which was the repository, if you like, of the enslaved population that were dragged, kicking and screaming and manacled and shackled across the Atlantic to work for free. 
And that helps to shed light on why it is that you have such a large black population in Texas. It also helps to shed light on why Texas was repeatedly denounced by abolitionist forces. In fact, the slogan amongst abolitionist forces, among which included John Quincy Adams, a former U.S. president in the 1820s, who had become a congressperson at the time that Texas was entering the United States of America, the slogan was that we would either corral Texas or Texas would mm -hmm. corral us. And as we look at the depredations of spearheaded by Governor Greg Abbott of Texas and his crusade against women's reproductive freedom and against so-called critical race theory, as we look at the antics of Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, who bears a remarkable resemblance to Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin, whose reactionary politics uh, gave rise to an adjective that describes an entire, entire epic, a noun that is speaking of McCarthyism. And so Texas is now corralling us. And so it's up to us to reverse that story. Otherwise, the rather uh, mournful last word to the title of my book, The Roots of U.S. Fascism, will become a grim and glum reality. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Wilmer Leon here in Inside the Issues is where you are, Sirius XM 126 Urban View. Dr. Gerald Horn is my guest. The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of American Fascism is the book. It's his latest book just released. We've been talking about Juneteenth since tomorrow, Sunday, is in fact Juneteenth. And uh, contrary to the dominant narrative, and I want to reiterate this, it wasn't that Union troops arrived in Galveston, Texas on June 19th, 1865 to find that the news of the proclamation had not yet reached Galveston. No, they, they knew what was going on, but there was very little that they were able to do about it until a military force working in their favor uh, showed up to provide them with the backup that, that they needed. Uh, we're listening right now to Cupbearers, Blue Mitchell off of The Cup Bearers, 1962 Riverside release. Blue Mitchell on trumpet, Junior Cook on tenor, Cedar Walton piano, Gene Taylor on bass, Roy Brooks on drums. Do yourselves a favor, folks. Keep it locked right here. Sirius XM 126, Urban View. We are back. What's happening in America? Dr. Wilmer Leon here and Inside the Issues is where you are. Sirius XM 126 Urban View. Dr. Gerald Horn is my guest. The book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of American Fascism. Uh, as we look to tomorrow, Sunday, June 19th, as we celebrate Emancipation Day or uh, Juneteenth, uh, this book gives a lot of historical context into in terms the realities of uh, of that time. And Dr. Horn, as always, thank you so much for staying with me. So you you mentioned uh, in the open that that Texas uh, that uh, um, that that Mexico uh, abolished slavery and that. To, uh, that Texas seceded in 1836, similar to the American uh, Revolution of 1776, so that they could perpetuate the enslavement of Africans. And this was before the Civil War. Civil War was uh, 1861 to 1845. A lot of folks did not realize the, the importance of Mexico in this process. And you've touched on it in the first segment, but if you could elaborate a little bit again because a lot of folks when they talk about the enslavement of africans in america they have no idea the role that texas played 
I'm sorry, the role that Mexico played and the role that Haiti played. Well, with regard to Mexico, it was under a president of African descent, Vicente Guerrero, that Mexico moved to abolish slavery, which kicks in motion this uh, process whereby Texas secedes from Mexico in 1836 and then, as noted, tries to secede from the United States 1861 to 1865 because the United States, it was thought, was moving to abolish slavery. And as you suggested, in 1776, the slave owners led by George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and slavers all, uh, they fear that London is moving towards abolishing slavery. And so they then moved to secede from the British Empire and establish the United States of America. By the way, uh, that point is so notorious that there is a very striking British film, Bell, B-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, uh, starring the South African actor, Google Mbatha Raw, that deals with the backdrop of the abolitionist, abolitionist movement in London that helped to give rise to secession in North America by 1776. I would go a step further and argue that one of the many reasons why Black people have received so much help in the United States of America is precisely because we did not support, by and large, the secession from the British Empire because we knew that it would lead to a tightening of the handcuffs on our wrists, the tightening of the handcuffs of slavery on our wrists, that it would lead to a spectacular growth in the slave trade, which it did by the 1790s. The newly born United States of America was in control of the slave trade to Cuba, competing vigorously with Texas in the 1840s with regard to the slave trade to the largest market of all, that is Brazil. And that process could have continued longer than it did, but for the Haitian Revolution of 1791 to 1804, a successful revolt of the enslaved in the Caribbean, which sends fear and trembling down the spines of enslavers, not least in the United States of America, which tries repeatedly to overthrow the revolutionary regime in Haiti. The revolutionary regime recognized that it's tenure and sovereignty would be limited, to put it mildly, as long as slavery obtained anywhere in this hemisphere. So they saw it, it as being in their interest to move to abolish slavery throughout this hemisphere, which is one of the reasons why if you look at the major slave revolts, Gabriel's in Virginia in circa 1800, uh, Denmark Vesey, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, about 200 years ago, Denmark Vesey, by the way, was in and out of Haiti repeatedly before he sought to lead a revolt of the enslaved in Charleston, South Carolina. All of these revolts, including in the Caribbean, for example, Barbados, 1816, they all have Haitian fingerprints all over them, which is one of the many reasons why we owe a remarkable debt of gratitude to Haiti. And it's one of the many reasons why Haiti has been punished so severely. You might have seen the New York Times piece just a week or two ago, which suggested that Haiti was forced to pay reparations to its former enslavers. Speaking mm -hmm. of the French, which crippled its economy, made it difficult to spend on education and healthcare. And of course, Haiti had to spend on a military to keep from being overthrown by these enslavers in Washington, D.C. I should also say that Washington, D.C. Uh, is not unfamiliar uh, with this process of paying reparations to enslavers, because when the Lincoln government abolished slavery in the District of Columbia in 1862, they paid reparations to the enslavers. And of course, the complement to that process was supposed to be sending the Black people in Washington, D.C. packing. Fortunately, perhaps not, that didn't happen. You know, when you just mentioned, you said one of the reasons why you think black people are still catching hell was because we did not support the American revolution because we saw a victorious uh, uh, American colonies as resulting in the tightening of the handcuffs on our wrists. That made me think about the legislation put forth by Congressman Gregory Meeks from New York wanting to chastise and penalize and pressure uh, the African countries 
that haven't backed the U.S. play in uh, in in Ukraine. And it, uh, I may I may be stretching for parallels, but but I, I I just saw a tremendous parallel there. No, you're not stretching at all. In fact, that Negro Congressman Meeks has lost his cotton pick in mind. <laughs> Obviously, he doesn't understand history. Obviously, he apparently does not realize that it's not in the interest of his black constituents in Southeast Queens to put pressure on African nations to go along with the sanctions crusade against Moscow, because to the extent that the United States and its North Atlantic allies are successful in boycotting Russian energy, natural gas, and petroleum, they will have to turn to natural gas in Algeria, petroleum in Nigeria and Angola, amongst other sites. To the extent that the North Atlantic countries boycott Russian gold, they're going to have to turn to South African gold. To the extent that the North Atlantic countries boycott Russian titanium necessary for jet, in, jet planes, for example, they'll have to turn to South African titanium. And to, when they turn in that direction, obviously they're going to be trying to pressure and control these African nations. And of course, we all know that NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, headed by the United States of America, has an inglorious record when it comes to Africa. I need only point you to the overthrow of the Gaddafi regime about a decade ago that led to his assassination on camera, I'm afraid to say, despite the overtures made to NATO by African leaders, including the, the leader of South Africa at that time. So Mr. Meeks really needs to be brought up to speed because he may be acting in the interest of his campaign donors on Wall Street. He's not acting in the interest of his constituents in Southeast Queens. One of the issues, getting back to your book, the counter-revolution of 1836, the Texas slavery Jim and Jim Crow and the roots of U.S. fascism, the role that Indians or indigens played in the mindset of folks, there was a, a great debate in the United States, one about whether they were just going to flat out exterminate the, the Native Americans, or whether they would move them to reservations. And you even had people who listed as their profession as Indian killers. If you could talk a little bit about the impact that that had on this entire issue. Well, what's striking about Texas is that it probably contained the most militant and fearsome groupings of indigenous and Native Americans in this, on this continent, which is saying something because you had uh, obviously a very fearsome and militant uh, Lakota people, oftentimes referred to the Sioux, uh, due north in, north in South Dakota, for example. But even as fearsome and as militant as they were, they paled in significant, in, in significance compared with the Comanches, the Lords of the Plains not to mention the Cado, C-A-D-D-O, who had an interlocking directorate with the Black people, or the Kiowa, K-I-O-W-A, who were forced to migrate southward into Mexico eventually where their descendants continued to, to reside. And so basically there was a split in ruling circles in North America. On the one hand, you had liberals, particularly in Washington, who thought, felt that the better part of wisdom was to sit up these so-called reservations or Bantustans, as they were called in South African apartheid land, where the indigenous uh, could flock. That was so-called Indian territory, today's Oklahoma. Recall that uh, as Texas is forming as an independent state, the United States uh, chases the Cherokee, the Choctaw, and the Creek out of the southeast quadrant of North America on the Trail of Tears as they walk and stumble into Indian territory from Georgia, from Georgia to Oklahoma. They were not very happy, to put it mildly, having to give up their land and their homes, oftentimes to European settlers, are fresh off the boat. But in any case, that was not good enough for the Texas reactionaries. They preferred liquidation, they preferred genocide, and they carried it out systematically. And that's one of the reasons why I see this book, among other things, as an antidote to the liberal fantasies that pass for history, that speaks of the United States being this great experiment in democracy. Certainly the vaunted Bill of Rights 
did not apply to the indigenous population nor the black population. Certainly the vaunted Second Amendment did not apply to the black population because the black people had the right to bear arms. Believe me, slavery would have ended well before 1865. And if you were a fan of the now discredited cinematic genre known as Westerns, you know that the stock villain is the settler who sold arms to Native Americans. And so one of the reasons why instead of these liberal fantasies about the so-called democratic experiment in North America, blah, 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 we need to be talking about the roots of fascism as evidenced by the attempted coup d'etat of January 6, 2021, and all these primaries that took place this week that suggest that the Republicans do not plan to have legitimate elections anytime soon. They may prevail in November. They will prevail in their minds by any means, necess any means necessary by November 2024. And so we need history that helps to bring us up to speed with regard to the present. Whereas this current fantasy that passes for history, it may have served a purpose in the 1960s when it was thought that we needed a rationale to justify the retreat of Jim Crow. And so this rationale was created of the United States as being this liberal bastion which means it should go forward with eroding Jim Crow. But we're at a different moment now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. We need a different history. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Wimmerly on here, Inside the Issues is where you are, Sirius XM 126 Urban View. Dr. Gerald Horn is my guest. The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of American Fascism is the book. And again, Tomorrow, Sunday, is June 19th, Juneteenth, the day we celebrate uh, as uh, Liberation Day. And this book gives you great, great insight into what led up to those events and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the history uh, of them. Right now, you're listening to Cutbearers. That's uh, Blue Mitchell, the uh, title cut off of The Cutbearers, 1962 Riverside. Do yourselves a favor, folks. Keep it locked right here, Sirius XM 126, Urban View. We are back. We are back. What's happening, America? Dr. Wilmer Leon here inside the issues is where you are. Sirius XM 126 Urban View. Dr. Gerald Horn is my guest. You're listening right there to Cupbearers. That's Blue Mitchell off of the Cupbearers, 62 Riverside. Uh, the Counter Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of American Fascism is the book. Uh, Dr. Horn, as always, thank you so much for staying with me. And what was there a catalyst that actually brought about the counter? Well, it that brought about the counter revolution. Other than abolition, yes, in Mexico, that was mm -hmm. the major catalyst. That, okay. that is to say, the desire to escape abolition. And of course, the, there are accoutrements to that process. So for example, uh, seizing more land of the indigenous population. Also keep in mind that during the era of Texas sovereignty and independence, Texas saw itself as a competitor to the United States of America. Texas saw itself as being the nation that was going to denude Mexico of California, today the richest and most populous state in the United States, which of course the United States itself seized in 1846 to 1848, of course, Texas was behind that process, but, that, but before that happened, uh, Texas had uh, California in the crosshairs. Texas also was willing to conspire with foreign countries against the United States of America, which makes this idea of Texas patriotism, so-called allegiance to the United States, uh, almost laughable, particularly since it tried to overthrow the United States government in 1861, and uh, was responsible for the killings of countless numbers of U.S. nationals because, of course, 
the U.S. Civil War was the bloodiest conflict that the United States government was ever involved in, which is saying something given Afghanistan, Vietnam, Korea, et cetera, uh, perhaps 700 to 800,000 U.S. nationals killed, which may be a low ball estimate. So Texas, in some ways, was the uh, bully boy of North America. And Texas today is still the bully boy of North America, hence the subtitle of my book that re refers to fascism. But keep in mind as well that during the era of Jim Crow, following the drowning in blood of Reconstruction, Reconstruction is the period following the end of the Civil War, formally 1865 to 1876, 1877 roughly, an attempt to construct a kind of experiment in black suffrage, for example, uh, Texas pioneers in ghoulish and ghastly lynchings of black people. Now, you know that Texas oil is part of the political economy uh, of this particular U.S. state. But with regard to lynchings, one of the uh, unique aspects of lynchings in Texas is oftentimes they boil black men, and of course the disproportionate victims of lynching were black men, they boil them in oil. And then in this pre-radio, uh, pre-television era, uh, thousands of settlers uh, would assemble, many of them would take photographs, some of which you can find on postcards in museums. Oftentimes the carcass of the dead Negro would be carved up and passed out like souvenirs to those assembled. And so Texas uh, really ha has a very difficult history to, to live down, which makes it even more curious how people can fix their mouths to talk about some sort of noble democratic experiment. They must have never stumbled across Texas, the most uh, second most populous uh, state in the United States of America, second only to California, which also suggests that Texas uh, plays a disproportionate role in today's U.S. House of Representatives, which is based upon population. It also points to another disturbing fact that on January 6, 2021, Texas was overrepresented in terms of the so-called insurrectionists, many more so than Virginia right next door or Maryland right next door. So Texas uh, has been spearheading these ultra-right-wing movements and the only possible competitor may be its northern neighbor, speaking of Oklahoma, formerly Indian Territory, as suggested, and Indian Territory was put on Texas' northern border uh, with specific reasons by Washington, because at that time, as noted, Texas was seen as a competitor to the United States of America, and Washington wanted to put this gruntled Native American on the northern border to keep uh, Texans' uh, attention and keep them in line. But what happens? is that many of the Cherokees and Choctaws in particular and their desire to assimilate to Euro-American settler culture had moved to enslave Africans, not to mention adopt Christianity and adopt the sartorial choices of the settlers by dressing like the settlers. However, after the US Civil War, Washington forced the Native American enslavers to try to carry forth on the promise of 40 acres and a mule, unlike those uh, enslavers in Virginia, Mississippi, et cetera. So what this means is that the black people in Oklahoma were able to accumulate a certain amount of wealth uh, unknown throughout most of the United States of America. And I'm sure you know where this story is heading. By 1921, the settlers in Tulsa then massacred the black people of the neighborhood, neighborhood known as Greenwood, sometimes referred to euphemistically as Black Wall Street, uh, take their property, take their wealth, send them packing, and that too helps to shed light on why Texas and Oklahoma are the two bully boys of North America. There's an inconsistency, I believe it's an inconsistency in terms of the role of uh, the of Black troops uh, during Reconstruction and what the role that many of those troops played in the U.S. attack on the indigenous, indigenous. How do you? I think that that's one of the most despicable and inglorious episodes in the corpus of Black American history. That is to say, 
that as black people in East Texas were being subjected to these ghoulish and ghastly lynchings that I've just described, and I won't repeat uh, what I said mm-hmm. a moment or two ago, in West Texas, you had black soldiers who were part of the U.S. military who were routing the indigenous population, engaging in ethnic cleansing on behalf of the government in Washington to make land and room for more settlers, settlers who then, of course, could then join the Ku Klux Klan in routing black people. This was a policy that was endorsed, I'm afraid to say, by the black leadership of that era, of what the late Glenn Float Ford might have called the black misleadership class. And given the fact that there has yet to be a full accounting or even acknowledgement that this was a flagrant blunder, it makes one wonder what kind of flagrant blunders are the black misleadership class forced them on the black community today? Probably you need only look mm-hmm. at foreign policy to get a glimpse of an answer. Well, ask Gregory Meeks. Um, but so what? So what was the logic or the rationale that was being used by the black misleadership class of that time to justify or rationalize the behavior of those black soldiers? Well, you have to realize that, and I'm sure you do realize that even today there is a really casually callous disregard for the interests of the indigenous population Mm -hmm. of North America. You see this even when the liberals seek to toss a bouquet at the feet of black people. I'm sure you've seen the phrase that slavery is the quote, original sin, unquote, Mm -hmm. of the United States of America. Now, at first glance, that might sound appealing, but then What about the invasion of the settlers taking the Native Americans' land, perpetrating genocide against them? That's sort of swept under the rug. And so the idea of the Black misleadership class post-1865 was that joining the military and engaging in ethnic cleansing and liquidation of the indigenous population was an emblem and insignia of U.S. citizenship just like joining the military in the late 19th century and going to the Philippines and routing the Filipinos on behalf of Washington was an emblem and insignia of U.S. citizenship, just like going to the Korean Peninsula, 1950 to 1953, and routing the Koreans on behalf of Washington was an emblem and insignia of U.S. citizenship. Going to Indochina, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia in the 1960s and 1970s and routing them. I mean, I could go on indefinitely. And of course, I'm afraid to say that you had black leadership of various stripes and sorts who have supported every harebrained foreign policy scheme that Washington could concoct. And that's really saying something since they've come up with so many harebrained schemes. Connect Texas slavery and Jim Crow and the roots of U.S. fascism. And if you could give a a working definition for the audience, they they hear the term fascism all the time, but most people probably don't really understand what the term actually means. Well, the shorthand is that fascism is a combination of the worst excesses of slavery and Jim Crow. Now, Black people have this tendency today to say that we endured slavery. No, you didn't endure slavery. You weren't alive before 1865. So stop trying to engage in this sort of cover up, uh, trying to reassure yourself, whistling past the graveyard to suggest that you could survive fascism. Another shorthand for fascism is, of course, the bloodthirsty rule of the most reactionary sector of the US ruling class people who would make Ted Cruz and Greg Abbott seem like liberals, for example. You saw a glimpse of that with regard to January 6th and the role of the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys, or you saw a glimpse of that in Buffalo a few weeks ago, and you saw a glimpse of that 
of course, with regard to our disproportionate sighting on death row, oh, that number today would seem like the good old days if fascism ever arrived on these shores. Now, what you need to realize is that despite the gloom and doom that some listeners may feel that I'm expounding about, there is room for optimism. The optimism being, as noted, that Texas has the largest black population in the United States. It's the population that tends to vote against the right nine to one. We know that Mexico historically has played a role in Texas and in the United States, oftentimes to Mexico's detriment. But today, as we speak, Mexico is beginning to lead a hemispheric bloc. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure that President Lopez Obrador recently visited Cuba. Mm -hmm. triumphantly just a few days ago. He boycotted the summit on the Americas uh, in Los Angeles, Los Angeles, just a few days ago. We are expecting the left to triumph in Brazil in elections in a few months. So I think that the lesson to Black Americans is clear. If we want to avoid a blooming kind of fascism, and that is we need to take seriously these slogans and mottos we oftentimes mouth without thinking, such as Malcolm X said, take it to the United Nations. Okay, fine. Go to the United Nations. Who are you going to align with? And before you align with them inside the door of the United Nations, maybe you want to establish a relationship with them before you arrive at the United Nations. Uh, this is the kind of thinking and planning that I'm afraid to say is beyond a significant percentage of the black misleadership class, but fortunately is not beyond the ambition of many of us. In fact, it's interesting that you make the point about the UN because if people have any understanding of history and understand the role that a lot of, uh, of African-American liberation leaders were formulating the relationships that they were developing, whether it be the, the, the Van Dung Conference or a, a number of other uh, developing relationships with, with non-aligned movements and, and the, uh, the African uh, anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist movements, uh, we're not, we don't seem to be doing that on the same levels now as we were doing then, and which to a great degree could be why we continue to have the struggles that we do because to your point, there's nobody right now for us to align with. You mean within the bounds of the United States of America? Correct. Well, sure. And I, I think that as I've said many times, including on this program, that a fateful turning point in our struggle arrived at the 1950s when the NAACP threw overboard Paul Robeson the premier internationalist of our era, spoke dozens of languages, had friends all over the world, which is one of the reasons he was such a threat. And obviously we need to recreate the spirit of Paul Robeson. And interestingly enough, uh, next year marks the 125th anniversary of his birth. And therefore there would be no better setting for a Robeson revival uh, than planning and projecting a uh, Robeson 2022 to 2023 uh, and beyond. When someone is finished with your book, the counter revolution of 1836, Texas slavery and Jim Crow and the roots of US fascism, what are the, what are the three most salient points that you want them to take away from uh, when they complete, when they complete the book? Well, first of all, this book, as noted, is an antidote to the liberal historiography that has misled generations of Black people and indeed generations of U.S. nationals. Certainly with this country a teetering on the brink of yet another attempted coup d'etat, and when a coup is plotted, and the evildoers are not jailed, and I mean the evildoers at the top, not just the foot soldiers, that guarantees that there will be a replica of that. And we need a history that helps to explain how we got to this moment, and this book does that, I believe. 
secondly, I think that this book is a lesson in black history, as noted. That is to say that this accepting of U.S. citizenship has come with a price, not only uh, waging these bloody conflicts in North America and beyond, but as a result of uh, ruining alliances with people we talk about going to at the United Nations, but I hope that when we show up in the United Nations, the Filipinos have a, a case of amnesia and don't recall uh, how our ancestors helped to rout them about 120 years ago. And then, of course, that brings me from Black history to global history, because I think we need to realize that during the time of Texas slavery, you had thousands of enslaved Africans escaping into Mexico. One of the reasons there was so much hostility to Mexico is because Mexico would not return this property to its so-called owners. And there was a de facto alliance between black people and Mexico, which helps to explain why we were able to escape the bonds of slavery. We need to revive that kind of global alliance because I'm afraid to say that the balance of forces right here in North America, with the ascendancy of these Trumpistas and neo-fascists is not looking very promising as we speak. In fact, one of, one of the points that you make uh, in the book very clearly is the, that what made Texas so unique from other uh, slaveholding states was there was a, a armed militaristic Mexico on its border that was, that was supporting uh, those enslaved Africans that were crossing the border. Well, absolutely. And Mexico, of course, was in alliance uh, with Haiti. Mexico tried to promote abolition in Cuba at a time when U.S. enslavers were dragging Africans across the Atlantic to be enslaved in Cuba. So we owe a debt of gratitude to Mexico as well, uh, which I'm afraid to say is not often repaid. And again, going back to uh, the current president, uh, AMLO, uh, who's not only uh, protested the so-called summit of some of the Americas, but led the protest uh, in terms of why Nicaragua wasn't invited, why Venezuela wasn't invited, why Cuba wasn't invited. And so we seem, we really seem now to see Mexico making a resurgence uh, in terms of its position in that regard. And Mexico sees it in its self-interest to try to reclaim its sovereignty. Uh, you have U.S. predatory investors crawling all over Mexico. Mexico is not necessarily happy about that. Mexico would be more than pleased to extend the friendship, uh, extend the hand of friendship to Black Americans. In fact, I end the book, if you recall, with a vignette of Martin Luther King III visiting Mexico, accompanied by AMLO, uh, going to the grave of the Mexican president of African descent, speaking of Vicente Guerrero, who 190 years ago uh, set in motion this chain of events by moving to abolish slavery in Mexico, which leads to Texas seceding, which then leads to this horror show of Texas today. And again, it makes me also think about where we are today with so many uh, people of color, particularly Haitians and other people of color, sitting on the border in Mexico trying to get into the United States as as not only the the Trump administration but the Biden administration following on following upon those changes in immigration policy are uh, are, are are holding those people uh, in in tents in the heat in Mexico well not only that but as you know more than most uh, there's the juxtaposition of how the Biden administration has embraced warmly uh, Ukrainian refugees, mm -hmm. uh, helping to usher in, we are told, 100,000 or more. New York Times conservative columnist Brett Stevens suggested that each one of these Ukrainians should have a green card hoist in their hands upon arrival on these shores, which would allow them to partake of benefits, welfare benefits of various sorts the billions that are pouring into Ukraine of our tax dollars at the same time that homelessness and hunger uh, stalk this inflationary land uh, boggles the imagination that this inflationary land being the United States of America. And at the same time, juxtapose how Haitians are manhandled and roughhoused 
along the Texas-Mexico border. There was an article in the New York Times yesterday that suggested that Haitians are overrepresented disproportionately in terms of the immigrants who are expelled from the United States and sent back to their homeland. Dr. Gerald Horn, where is the Congressional Black Caucus? We don't know. Dr. Gerald Horn, appreciate it. Look forward to having you back. Thank you. Folks, the counter-revolution of 1836, Texas slavery and Jim Crow.